So what is Bromium doing? Bromium has figured out a way to use virtualization technology. So forget everything you know about hypervisors today. Mm -hmm. A way to use virtualization technology, specifically hardware-assisted virtualization, okay. to dramatically change the way that you can get control over running code at a very, very granular basis. So even the attack that I just mentioned to you, where an attacker attacks via an output attachment or a browser attack or something, we have very, very precise control, courtesy of a hypervisor, of the running code. Mm -hmm. And then we force all, all communication with the outside world from, world from any running code to occur by a very, very, very narrow interface, which is the hyperpool interface between a VM and a hypervisor. Okay. And there are only about eight things you can do there. You can send a packet and receive a packet. You can put a block or get a block of storage. You could you know, request access to a file or try and put something to a file. Um, and you can do copy and paste and a few other things. And so it's a tiny little interface, which is about 10,000 lines of code, which is designed for security. And at that point, you have explicit control over execution, and you have an unprecedented ability to decide what you want to do. So let's go back to that attack. If, um, if there's an, an Outlook attachment which I open, which is now trying to upload a file to the internet, say, I'm going to see it right there because I am in charge of everything that goes into or comes out of that piece of running code. Okay, And wow. so through very granular control over execution, there's sort of a magic hypervisor, um, and this explicit very low-level control over all I.O. and all resource access, we get a whole new look at the security problem. Okay. Um, at the same time, you can think of it as being desktop virtualization done right, because I can do this on a PC, or I can do it on a server, I can do it on, in the cloud. Okay, so just another way of doing virtualization, but it seems to have a much better approach, much better approach to solving the real security problem. Okay, so you're just really different from what the guys from security is, are doing for the, the desktop yes. virtualization, so, so, the so, because there are many the companies... Security, yeah, the, the traditional security guys have been trying to solve the problem by blacklisting. So you say, I try and know about an attack before it happens. So they, they try to, to put some traditional security uh, process to the virtualization, but they're not right doing that, or they're doing something else? Uh, actually, all that they have managed to do so far is take their traditional security methods and make them run on top of a hypervisor. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's kind of ho-hum, really, because the traditional security methods have broken. That is, blacklisting has failed. The whole, the whole point of blacklisting is that I can identify an attack and distribute a signature for the attack so that anybody can be protected. The problem is that there's enough compute power on the average desktop that the attacker can change fast enough that you'll never be able to detect them. So that problem is just finished. Okay. Um, and then the other one is whitelisting, which is, and think about what we've done in desktop virtualization before, it is kind of whitelisting. Say, I know everybody's running the latest and greatest copy of Windows with all the patches. Good. I know everybody's running the right copy of the apps. And I can do better and better and better about making sure that the code that is there is good and approved. The problem is every, every piece of code is vulnerable and can always be subverted to make an attack on the system. For example, Apple. I mean, I could be running everything great, but it's just that I can inject some code into the system and then and then we have an attack. So it's not well, it's not any protection against zero days or drive-bys or any of these kind of attacks where you don't know about the attack beforehand because it's never been seen in the wild before. Okay. Okay. And at the same time, it gives you all of the control that you would have, um, for example, in if you think back to the WikiLeaks stuff, right, mm -hmm. where part of the problem there was that <clears throat> You know, people had access to devices. You have to plug in a USB device, download a bunch of stuff. Well, of course, you get to inject policy then to decide what you want to do. So it's just a much more, it's a much more granular way of doing virtualization with a specific object in mind, which is ensuring that we can deal with this problem of multi-tenancy within one piece of code. That's a, that actually at the end of the day, that is the problem. I got Windows or my OS, whatever it happens to be, my OS it could be Linux or Mac OS, right? And I have all of these different sources of trust the enterprise, and then every website I visit, every I ever talk to, and all of their interests are vested and concurrently running in one blob of code, okay. which is very poor at partitioning them into different zones of trust. 
And the best way of partitioning things into zones of trust is a, is a hypervisor, because hypervisor and hardware assisted to it, because the moment any piece of code wants to talk to anything outside its little world, mm -hmm. I get control again as the hypervisor. And so we have a unique way of then uh, imposing granular policies or getting an ability to decide what to do when the code is running. Okay, so it seems like a, this is magical. <laughs> You're just solving it's, all the problems. Like and so there's one more piece of magic which is kind of cool, and that is that <clears throat> we can do this without any change to the user experience. Okay. So the user just gets their desktop. Wow. <laughs> that's so nice. that's why you raise so, a lot of money because they have you have to develop this now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You so just we, have the dream. So, and <laughs> we started the company with uh, working demos. Uh, we should have uh, yeah, we're going to get product done within six months or six to nine months. Okay. So it's a, you know it's a long way. It's back back to technology for for me. You know just. Uh, Getting down to the hard front edge of, of building complicated products, and, and we'll, you know, we're either going to pull it off or we'll disappear in a big puff of smoke. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think so. And what, what's the plan? It's just like working with everything. You're just partnering in the future with cloud right, providers, like, uh, or you don't you know, know. In a startup, as you know, you just got to do yeah. one thing: do your product great. Right? So, but the good thing is, so our core team is um, Ian. Ian Pratt, who, mm -hmm. who is the chairman of Zen.org and you know, led all the development on Zen client. Mm -hmm. He's in Cambridge. I'm in uh, the US. Gaurav Banga, who's our CEO, is in the US. He's in Cupertino, okay. so the Silicon Valley. And our core engineering base is in, in the US and in Cambridge. Okay. Uh, the company is already 15 people. Um, okay. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we're hiring great people out of the Zen world and great people out of VMware. <laughs> Oh, okay, <laughs> so you're because, mixing. Uh, there's been VMware always had great people, and they're right up the road from us. And they, you know, so there's some great people there who want to go and do a new thing. Okay, but well, it's just something you're developing in open source, I guess. Just like there are you're already open source components of what we do, and there are also proprietary components. My model of open source is, you know, I love the model of open source where yeah. the core, I know the that, core <laughs> the core capabilities need to be open, and then you know the. You want to add proprietary stuff, which is then how you differentiate and make money out of it. Okay. At the moment, Bromium is, Bromium is cool technology. It's really awesome technology. And then you think, well, how am I going to take it to market? I, you know, I don't want to go and sell security because customers don't pay for security. Users don't appreciate it. They have no way of knowing that they're more secure or less secure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so desktop virtualization is a good way to go about it. When I talk to people about desktop virtualization, it is becoming a really big deal. Yeah. Uh, part of the big deal there is new devices, you know, okay. delivering, delivering apps to new to broader sets of devices and mobility. Yeah. So in, in the technology world, I've spoken most about clients, right? Um, you know, there's another Omium out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it's kind of a pun on that one. Go think about what that Omium is. Uh, you know, in general, if you if you think about the the problem of isolation. Um, there are two ways you can go about it. One of them is you can try and do isolation at the application level. Mm -hmm. So it's things like Chrome, the browser, and Chromium. Um, you know, they've tried to do it by building a better and better isolation layer between the app and the OS. And you know what? It's just fatally flawed. It's never going to work. Okay. It's an extremely difficult problem. It's extremely porous interface. And everybody who's ever tried it, the Chrome team has done the best. But they still have vulnerabilities, as we keep seeing. And it's uh, always vulnerable to an update of the base OS, which can change the APIs, in which case you're all done for again. Okay. And so, you know, instead of trying to come at this isolation problem from the app down and build this app isolation layer, which, by the way, you find in App V or, mm -hmm. or uh, any one of the application virtualization layers, yeah, okay. um, there's a better way to do it, which is to say, what's the most primitive thing you could ever get control of? And that comes way down the stack in the hypervisor, where you get explicit control of the execution flow in a, in a VM, and um, and you get explicit control of the layer. Okay. So that's, that's the approach. <laughs> it's just like, a, it's for the chemist, uh, the, ke the chemistry guy is just like, uh, <laughs> what is that name? Yes, right. You'll see some other <laughs> funny things, we're planning some other funny things around chemistry, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was something, okay, um, that's all right. Um,
I don't have any more questions, I guess, on Bromen. Good. So. Well, thank you. Thanks. It's so always wonderful. Is that, yeah, all, all the benefits of virtualization to date have been really around agility, availability, consolidation, and so on. And all of that is good. It's got IT to be more automated and so on. But, um, you know, if you, could, if you can use virtualization technology to dramatically change the odds in security, that's bigger than all of those benefits put together, right? Because, you know, the biggest problem facing us in the cloud and on the client and everywhere is security. And the bad guys are really bad nowadays. I think that's the other change, is that the bad guys are now really, really good. There's a lot of money you've made in the, in the malware world, and, uh, and they're, they're out there in force and attacking hard. So if we can use virtualization technology to dramatically change the odds there, then that will be a big deal. Wow. Thank you very much, Simon. My pleasure. <laughs> wow, I'm impressed, as always. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll see. I will do it or we won't, but you'll be able to track us. <laughs> and it's always fun to talk to you.